Now, uh, I would request Dr. Arvind Bermani to make uh, his remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> given the limited time I have, which is seven minutes, uh, I usually uh, give talks on growth which are minimum of 45 minutes to one hour. So uh, you will excuse me if I sound incomprehensible because I don't know how to squeeze it into seven minutes. So one of the uh, central challenges in growth theory is acceleration of growth. You know, there's huge amounts of literature on it. And one of the characteristics is that they are find it very difficult to get generalizations. But that doesn't mean there aren't any. So what I'm going to do is, is tell you the experience of India of how we accelerated growth in, in six minutes. And why is it important? Well, people have talked about similarities and differences. It turns out there is recent research which shows roughly an 80% overlap between what has been found internationally to accelerate growth and what we actually did, uh, in my view, quite consciously, because I was part of it for 20 years <coughs> from 1987 onwards. So what is it? So we started this process in 91, and one of the essential elements is restoring macro balance. <coughs> it's very important to restore it and we've heard uh, you know, various speakers here talk about it. Uh, let me leave it with that. But there are two important uh, ways to look at it. We normally look at restoring macro balance in the short term. What we did consciously in India is to think about how we could sustain that macro balance, not just restore it. The restoring part was relatively easy. It's a standard classical thing of what we call expenditure switching and expenditure reduction. But the more critical one for growth was this sustaining. And there were two elements of that. One was the fiscal. And we've already talked about tax reform, so I won't go into it, though I might refer to it later as very briefly if I have time. And the second is the external balance. And then the second major part of it, what the IMF World Bank calls structural reform, which we deliberately chose to call policy reform. And I still use that term because partly we had this uh, kind of, not love-hate, but hate relationship with the international institutions. We don't like to be uh, uh, follow orders. So uh, the, uh, so what, what, what is it? What, what do we mean by policy reform? I think the earlier speaker has given you an idea. It's about incentives for productivity and investment, for productive investment, actually. So what we did was we looked at, uh, we looked at the Southeast Asia and said, here are countries which are growing there. Can we learn anything? There wasn't much. You really have to apply these lessons to your own country. And that's why uh, you know, that I'm not going to talk directly about Pakistan, but if we have a discussion or a question, we can do that. But what we did is we looked at all the problems in India very, very carefully, the domestic policy controls and the external side. To run through uh, those elements, and we addressed each of these. One was. We had a unique situation. I think, again, it has been pointed out by the first speaker. We have this unique situation of what we call the license permit quota raj. That is control on virtually every aspect of the economy. I think that's probably we were a complete outlier uh, in 1980 and 1991. And that's one thing which is different. Uh, as he very rightly said, Pakistan actually decontrolled much, much earlier. And it turns out, if you look at it, that was the time when it grew fast. But as I said, I don't have time uh, to go into all the issues of Pakistan. So one, what we did was we decontrolled all real output, which is prices, production, investment. Secondly, we looked at financial, domestic controls. We had all the sector, banking controls, uh, equity issue, everything was controlled. We deliberately and systematically decontrolled those things. Public sector units. Uh, I have recent work uh, uh, which uh, we can refer to but one of the things which we found is that PSU disinvestment played a critical role in improving productivity in the 90s. These are actually papers, uh, one of them actually an IMF staff paper. The second aspect of this PSU was we had extensive monopoly of the public sector. So it was very difficult to immediately privatize these institutions. So what we did again very deliberately was to first make it uh, allow uh, private entry to introduce competition into the monopoly sectors. Uh, this is the political economy which I think Surjit was referring to in an earlier session. A lot of uh, policy making uh, resolves around 
marrying economics with politics and that a key role is played by somebody inside the government who understand these things. That's the role in a way uh, I played for 20 years within the government. Yet we are still not completed and one of the reasons uh, is that we haven't done agricultural reform along the lines we said, infrastructure and, so, and, and social sectors like education. So still a part of this remains yet to be done. The other uh, aspect of this decontrol was extensive import decontrol. And here I want to make a point about tariff reform. We actually went from uh, roughly 150% tariffs actually QRs produce some even higher ones, maybe up to 300% uh, to 10% maximum, which we have now. And this played an important role in not only introducing competition, but also allowing companies to import inputs and capital goods. Finally, not finally, uh, uh, we, uh, on, uh, um, Ila has talked about the capital flows. Again, we had a deliberate strategy of opening up of FDI, equity markets, long-term debt and short-term debt. It was a phase program which was done systematically uh, for at least 10-15 uh, years. And uh, uh, here I just want to give a, a, a reference uh, to something we talked about in the earlier sections about research to convince people. Actually, you know, uh, it turns out the, that the bureaucrats and the politicians are most difficult to convince because they have a certain amount of knowledge. And just to give you one example, I served on a hundred committees. You know, people think it's very easy to do reform. I served on hundred committees in these 20 years. And what was that purpose of that committee? Not to do research. It's to convince them of basic concepts like effective protection, for example, that we have to reduce tariffs on X or Y. So what I had to do was to get deeply into sectoral and industry tariffs to be able to communicate with the revenue department. Because otherwise, when you come and say opening is good for the country, they'll tell you 10 different examples, okay, where they can show this industry will die. And I couldn't answer those till I actually understood the exact tariff and protection in those sectors. So that's the kind of research you have to do if you really want a major policy reform. The final point, market determined exchange rate. Okay? So we had a package of things which went together uh, to produce what turned out uh, was an acceleration of 3.2% above the international growth rate. You know, you'll hear a lot uh, from India these days, including my friend here, the Secretary DEA, about how a lot of uh, the current decline in growth rate is due to external factors. Well, I've done the research. It shows actually, well, two things it shows, that in the, in, in, uh, 90, uh, uh, in the last year for which we have the international data, India was the fifth best performing country, despite the decline in growth rate, incidentally. But, the growth had declined substantially in the last three years. Uh, so uh, that is where you come into this issue of sustaining growth. It's not just a manner, matter of accelerating it, but you also have to sustain it. And one of the interesting papers on this issue says that there are different things you have to do for accelerating and sustaining. Uh, I have a minute. Uh, let me end with the part which we didn't do. Uh, which was uh, factor markets. You know, you heard a lot about uh, urbanization. Well, it turns out the critical uh, policy variable there is land, okay? Unless you have a good land market, and again, it'll vary from country to country. What does good mean? What are the problems in your land market? Maybe different from the ones I have in uh, India, but you have to reform the land market if you want efficient urbanization. Uh, governance and institutional. I agree completely with, I think, the two uh, earlier speakers from Pakistan who said security is a baseline. You know, unfortunately for us at that time in our history, security was not a problem. But it's very important. I think I agree 100% with the two of you that that is basic. I really cannot see. Governance actually can be postponed. Governance we are coming to now. You know, we are now looking at all police, legal, judicial reform. We got the 6% growth rate uh, per capita uh, for 10, 12 years without the governance reform. So you can get by without uh, certain elements of governance, but you can't uh, do it without security. Thank you.
Uh, I don't know how it is in Pakistan, but in India, the bureaucracy plays a very important role in uh, being that uh, cap on the pressure cooker. So you can uh, punch the bureaucracy when you wish, and then you feel pretty good, and then, then things become all right. I don't know whether it's the same is true for Pakistan too. Uh, now, the last panelist, Dr. Ibrahim Stevens. Thank you very much, um, Chairman. Uh, I think I'll just remain here and uh, try to optimize the seven minutes. I think I agree with the last speaker, seven minutes is perhaps too short a time to do justice to any of the presentations. I'm from the IGC, but my background is in central banking, so I'm a central banker by profession. So what I'll do is I'll focus on the second presentation and try to share some insights into how you operationalize the use of macro models in central banking. Um, I did that because I, I'll do that because I actually, I've actually done the job, but also I've um, had the opportunity to work with other central banks um, across the world in this particular exercise. But before I do that, just permit me to make a couple of remarks on the first and uh, third presentation. Um, Pakistan's long-run growth prospect. I was struck by the discussion about the exchange rate. Why was it so important? It seemed to me that um, uh, that may, may be suggesting that uh, the actual measurement of slack in the economy is not particularly accurate. Um, and this is not just unique to Pakistan. So perhaps the exchange rate is, is another way of capturing slack or, capa or capacity utilization in the economy. And I'll, I'll discuss this when I discuss the model um, later on. Because you don't have a good, um, a good handle on actually what is, the, what is the best measure for slack in the economy, you can see that a deviation of the exchange or movement in the exchanges can actually be capturing some useful information in that regard. On the third paper on financial uh, integration, this is a subject very close to my heart because I did a lot of my PhD work on this. Um, I think what is important is every measurement of financial integration or every assessment of financial integration has to be backed up by good understanding of economic linkages between the countries. If the, if the financial linkages do not reflect economic linkages, then there's a, there's a mismatch or there's um, inaccuracy in the measurement of financial integration. So if, when you try to interpret these correlations, when you try to capture these um, external shocks and see the effects on your, on your economy, what should be your primary sort of um, measure is that these correlations ought to reflect fundamental economic linkages between the countries. Otherwise, what you're seeing is not true financial integration, but something else. Okay, now to the um, macro model itself. I think what is important in any modeling exercise is that the, the model must capture the policymaker's notion of the economy, of what is, what is the attributes of the economy, what is the key factors driving shock or shock analysis in the economy. So as you go about um, building this model, as you go about operationalizing this model, I think the most important thing you ought to do is get the board or the monetary policy committee involved in this process. You really need to sit down with each policymaker, ask them, what do you think about the economy of Pakistan? When you sit down and make a decision on interest rate, what are the factors, um, which factors do you take into consideration? If your model is able to capture that, then you're doing a very good job. All models are wrong. All models are wrong. Some models are useful. Okay, so I am, of the, I am from the school of thought that believe in working with a suite of models. So what I will also advise is, and as I've seen this work in practice, is don't restrict yourself to the simulation that come out of just one model. Try to do cross-platform counterfactual simulations. That way you are, this is, this is a basic Bayesian approach, but it's actually very good because you do a model average across different models and you're able to, to in, a, in a concise way, capture and aggregate your best understanding, given the tools that are available, um, of what is driving these shocks. I think that's very, very useful. 
And uh, I also think that um, when you do modeling, it is important to understand that judgment is actually critical. So, and this is why speaking with the policymakers helps a lot. Um, good judgment helps close the model, helps complete the model. If I look at, if I look at some known sort of uh, paradoxes that we have in the macro lit literature, it is because we kind of restrict ourselves to just the outcome of the model. The outcome of the model itself is not sufficient. This off-model information informs your judgment and helps you make in totality a better use of the model itself. I think those are, those are very, very important because the model, you know, don't answer all the questions that we that we that we have. Uh, let me go back to the to the exchange rate and uh, why I said that the exchange rate gap in Pakistan might be perhaps you know, a second or additional measure of slack in the economy. The fact that the, the exchange rate exercises all policymakers to the extent that um, you know, we, we, we describe actions of policymakers as intervention in the market, to me, it gives me an idea that actually I, that would be useful in measuring uh, slack in the economy. So when you do your assessment of the output gap, I would, I would also two minutes to go. I would also um, try and replace your measure of the output gap with some measure of the exchange rate gap to see whether or not your simulations might be different. I think that would be, that would be very, very useful. And just back to the DSG models, the DS, DSG models are not an end in themselves. There's been countless criticisms of how effective these models were. First, they failed to they fail to predict the financial crisis because we don't have an accurate measure of financial risk in these models. So how do you capture risk? From a, you know, from a technical standpoint, you need to do higher order of approximations for it to actually you know, get a, a good policy function in trying to, to um, measure the effects of financial risk in your model. So these models don't capture financial risk very well. So we need to use other models in conjunction with the DSG model to be able to get a good perspective, a good handle on that aspect of, of the model, generally speaking. So, we, which again, make me enforce the point that you should be able to combine both the theoretical model and data-driven models to arrive at what would be a useful optimal policy decision. Um, maybe I'll conclude by saying that um, um, for your DS, DSG model to actually have any sense of purpose or being useful um, uh, to any degree, you should, we should be able to convince ourselves that the, the, the interpretation you receive from the DSG model, I'm speaking now specifically in terms of correlation between macro variables, what the theoretical DSG model predicts should be as close as possible to what you observe in the data. So the greatest challenge you have is taking the DSG model to the data, which is what we call taking the DSG model to the policy environment. And it is important that you try and shrink between the predictions of the model and what the, the data actually tells you. If you do a better job of, sh of understanding um, how you shrink between the two, I think the model is very useful. Okay, with those remarks, I should... Uh, and then pass over to the chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. It, it is uh, four o'clock now. So how much time do we have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Shall we just take about five questions? But my request is that uh, please make them questions. We don't have time for long interventions. So if there are any questions in the audience. Uh, yes, please identify yourself and ask the question and also say who uh, is the subject of your question. Uh, my name is Ali Khazar. I represent Business Recorder. Uh, I have a couple of questions. One for the monetary policy. Uh, uh, that's uh, the independence of the monetary policy in Pakistan. As in, uh, uh, for the past many years, uh, government remained the uh, uh, main borrower so it's, it's it's a stakeholder over there and it has a dominance in the board of the directors of uh, uh, the state bank uh, um, which is evidently uh, uh, 
dominated by the uh, ministry of finance and its representatives uh, there was some sort of uh, uh, independent committee but that's no more here so how effective is the policy when you have the main stakeholder uh in deciding it upon the policy that's one question uh and uh, the other question is is uh, to uh to, uh to to one of the indian presenters that uh, they would talk about that their fti increases in the uh, in the past 6 8 month while the fpi declines what what are the reasons attributed to it as we when see that in the pakistan case they both moved in one direction at one time thank you if i if i may respond to that uh um, um hamza my suggestion is we can collect couple of questions oh i'm sorry oh, okay oh okay collect the question first and then respond yeah i think we'll just collect the questions okay quickly yeah yeah and i can any other questions sorry i i can't see the light yeah please identify yourself yeah i'm 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 tarun rabi uh, mona college uh this question is to uh atif sorry it's 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 a comment disguised as a question um other what you're saying is that you know policy is 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 perhaps less interesting in pakistan than than what might be called constitutional economics which is the rules of the game and in pakistan this issue has been discussed right so right from the beginning whether you know what is islam's role in 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 the pakistani society politics federalism democracy political instability so these things are 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 discussed but now they are being discussed in 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 formal academic literature too right in political economy institutions even you know people who are affiliated with igc and all that so in in some senses it's not a mystery to do this right so there is when you said ke what i'm saying is ke what you are proposing is ke we should really have a a, a political economy slash institutional agenda to really understand macro economics in pakistan to take into account all of these different kinds of things is that the right way to think about what you said dr balla Yes, yeah, since, since the door to comments has opened up, I've taken courage to uh, make a comment. But it is a uh, couple of points on Mia's paper uh, or presentation. First, you know what is you know, quite fascinating is that the natural experiment of India and Pakistan has had a switching point prior to 1992, a very long, long, long-lasting. and need to be reversed but just to conclude the estimates are that if disaster hadn't struck pakistan that basically its per capita income would be about three times higher than what it is today any other question yes in the back please Antonio Marasco from Lams uh I have a question for the monetary policy paper and uh, uh I think it was a, an attempt to underline the difference in uh, pass through if I understand correctly from the policy rate to the uh, bank loans uh, compared to the standard model which is the one that probably applies elsewhere so but uh in recent times there have been uh, uh many discussions of uh, the presence of a liquidity trap in uh, in places where generally the standard model is applied so liquidity trap being zero nominal interest rate and uh, perhaps then uh, the uh, difference between what you call the standard model if you include liquidity trap effect and your uh, pakistani model would be much reduced in that sense so i was wondering if it's possible in your simulations to include a liquidity trap uh, situation to capture this as well uh okay so shall we now close the questions and then we can get to the answers perhaps i'll start with answering the last other than the other features that you were highlighting in the model 
the governance issue or, 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 or the uh, yeah i think it's called the governance issue the, when the fiscal authority is part of the process where decisions are taken it gets very diluted i'll add a small remark here actually and that is related to the uh, session in the morning and that's directly actually related to my concern here uh, or issues we were highlighting uh, we were talking about incentives in the morning the different kind of incentives for uh, taxpayers and taxpayees um, my question is here and that's the problem we are facing in terms of monetary policy what is the tax authorities incentive actually to go ahead with the reform if they know they can always print money to finance the gap none in my experience or very little for that matter um, that's the power of, of central banking it's a very old phrase actually there are only three important human inventions uh, fire wheel and central banking uh, I, I think central banking in Pakistan really takes it to the heart and we are printing money out of thin air and that is creating virtually no incentive to have the tax reform in place so my question to the participants in the morning would be um, can they control for this macro feature in their randomized, uh, randomized control experiments because that has a direct bearing on the effectiveness of monetary policy in Pakistan which we were highlighting as long as the tax GDP ratio is far too low um, monetary policy is just going to be appendage of fiscal authority or fiscal policy making <coughs> Okay, very interesting question about differences in behavior of FDI and FII. Now, FIIs, uh, as we saw here, the, they're the portfolio investors, right? So they invest in equity markets. And what we saw was that they were positive feedback traders. So when the market uh, did badly, they sold. And then in our event window, five days, they continued to sell. And maybe they did after that as well. So they don't want to be holding stocks whose value has fallen. Also, when the VIX rose, the S&P VIX rose, they started uh, selling. So there was uh, higher uncertainty in the US, and they sell here. So that's the behavior that we have studied. For FDI, though I haven't studied it, but from anecdotal evidence, uh, what I can say is that there are two kinds of FDI, uh, certainly two kinds of FDI coming into India. One is greenfield, and the other is private equity. And a lot of the, uh, and the greenfield may be completely unrelated to uh, what is happening to the stock market because you know you're setting up a factory you're it's a long-term project you're deciding when to come in you come in when FIPB gives clearance when the uh, if there is a change in policy required the you know multi uh, FDI in retail for example you come in then so you know it's a long process when somebody is doing greenfield investment or even a very uh, strategic investment and they don't respond to changes in stock markets private equity might respond to changes in stock market but in a different way so what do they look at they look at the price earnings ratio of a company they look at valuations and there in fact if the stock market is down then you get more attractive valuation so when you're buying and when you're doing an m a you might actually a private equity uh, might find uh, uh, it better th that more attractive at that time and then buy indian companies so that though i must say that yes policy makers do seem to be saying here's another area for research and hopefully IGC will support that research so that's something we'll do later thank you well um, so I will just quickly uh, try and wrap up what has happened it's very interesting that the subject uh, for this uh, discussion was macroeconomics and foreign investment very little went into what FDI is, which is a long-term investment. So we looked at many other issues now. So let me just inject a little bit on foreign direct investment. I think that's very critical from the long-term perspective of any country. And how does macroeconomic, uh, what are the key macroeconomic variables that are believed to affect FDI? Uh, and everything that uh, is part of that uh, particular list has been spoken of today by different speakers uh, and therefore it all fits into this long-term perspective. GDP growth obviously because if you're looking at a long-term investment into any country, you would be looking at what are the long-term GDP growth trends. If you put their money in a country where the trend growth is quite stab stable and secular. Now, exchange rate 
uh, weak or strong, I think the first speaker, who uh, the, pa the, per uh, the presenter had said this, that it's not a question of whether the, uh, the Pakistani rupee is 110 or at 90. Uh, the same would be true in the case of India too, at what level it is. But the question is how volatile the exchange rate is, and that really impacts uh, investments. Last year, we went through this uh, uh, this uh, a nightmare of having seen rupee almost in uh, Indian rupee almost into a free fall uh, from close to 50 uh, it went to 67 uh, 68 and uh, there was this this tremendous belief that uh, uh, there is going to be a sudden collapse of the currency because it was simply falling and therefore we had to take some very strong steps to bring confidence back, back into the market and uh, and then the rupee strengthened we have seen that in the last year between may and uh, and september rupee was actually indian rupee was actually an outlier in the emerging markets if you see that in terms of worst performing currency uh, in the present from january onwards when the next second taper started india has again rupee has been an outlier it has been the best performing currency so it's it's a uh, uh, in that six months, we were able to stabilize the currency and uh, keep it range bound, which is at the moment happening, and uh, also build up the reserves during this period. So, uh, today, at the time when the taper started, we were our reserves were about $275 billion. Today, we are close to $300 billion. I hope by 31st May, we should we should exceed that uh, that number so <clears throat> exchange rate plays a very important role in terms of giving that confidence uh, to the investor trade openness was the first presenter had had said this i think is very critical uh, trade openness is one part but as he said it is creating core competence in certain sectors uh, unfortunately for india and i must say this this is a weakness that we have our our manufacturing sector has continuously declined which is a matter of great concern and now presently the government is uh, fully focused on bringing manufacturing back as as a factor in the economic growth uh, we have uh, phenomenal growth in the services sector and FDI also it largely come into the services sector, but we need to work towards getting the manufacturing back. Interest rates, uh, the, uh, the presentation on monetary policy was very interesting. Uh, we uh, do believe there is a and I'm giving you a government's perspective, the finance ministry's perspective because uh, in India, the Reserve Bank of India is, is uh, quite autonomous, more autonomous than we wish it was, uh, but it is very independent of the government and it takes its own decisions. But um, in fact, on the board of the Reserve Bank of India, we are only uh, two government nominees uh, out of the uh, nine board members that they sit there. And uh, we are routinely outnumbered and routinely our objections are dismissed. So so we, we know that the authority is fairly independent on that. But there is this issue about targeting inflation, which is a question which keeps coming back. In India, we have recently seen this. Uh, th there was a Deputy Governor, Urjit Patel, he gave a report, which is a very sound report from the perspective of a long-term uh, path that should be followed in terms of how the the monetary policy should uh, should uh, pan out but all over the world I think uh, the focus purely on uh, on uh, price stability or on inflation targeting uh, is no longer the sole focus of the central banks there is this whole issue of bringing balance between growth and uh, and um, inflation targeting and where that balance uh, sits I think is still very open that debate is very open and I think there needs to be a much more uh, research on that count as to how do, are you going to manage these two things in the case of India for instance very interestingly inflation if you uh, if you um, were to deconstruct in inflation you would see food inflation plays a very critical or very big role in food inflation uh, 
uh, inflation in fruits and vegetables, for instance, has played a very critical role. In the CPI, if you see the consumer price index in India, uh, food constitutes almost uh, 50, uh, more than 50 percent of the weight in in the in the uh, in the index. Now, in which case, uh, we have seasonality which um, impacts also. In November, for instance, onions, uh, the inflation in onions was 380 uh, percent. From a price of 90 rupees a kilo, they have now fallen to 5 rupees a kilo. Uh, am I correct on that? Okay. So, uh, it's, it's um, basically there is this volatility which we have not been able to deal with. And I think which uh, the point which Dr. Vermani made here that in agriculture we need to do a lot of reforms I think holds. We need to do a lot of reforms in the agriculture marketing uh, area and uh, that is uh, one pending area that needs to be looked at clearly. Uh, so uh, if you look at these factors and then you see uh, how uh, the investor looks at, I think the investor would like to see how the uh, his investment or her investment is going to behave 10 years from now or 20 years from now in india in fact we have in the last five years uh, created tremendous bottleneck for uh, investors and this has come in the form of environmental clearances for for instance they have become a major uh, hurdle and uh, or it is in the name of security. I mean, I, I think security is a question which has been raised here also. But we are also grappling with this issue about how do you look at security clearances for investment. And uh, I think there is a positive movement to, on that. Since last January, we have been able to uh, unblock uh, about 306 pro la very large projects with a total investment project cost of about $106 billion. And I think in the next one year, we will see the impact of it in terms of real investments coming in the economy, which the last point, growth, uh, is going to impact growth. And that investment would also include foreign investments, which is long-term investment coming into the country. So at the end of the day, I do believe that unless your uh, the macroeconomic uh, situation in this country is sound. The long-term prospects of stability are intact. Uh, investors would come in, uh, even when they come in uh, into the stock market, they would come into the debt segment from where they can escape faster than equities where liquidity sometimes can be an issue and a problem. And we have seen that experience also in India. So I would like to uh, thank the uh, presenters of the papers who have put together a uh, tremendous effort in bringing uh, such excellent papers out. Also the panelists who have given uh, a great insight into some of the issues that, uh, that have um, uh, an impact on investment and also to the IGC for giving me the opportunity to f for being here. Thank you very much.